Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am so pleased to introduce you to my next episode of my podcast. I can't even remember if it's episode 21 or 25, but I know it's the day that my former rival, uh, who's no longer on Twitter, is getting impeached in the United States. I want to start by thanking you so much, my listeners. We, you know, we are growing. It's unbelievable. 20 countries have downloaded my podcast. Four of them are from dictatorial regimes, and the others are democratic-run uh, uh, countries. So I am really pleased, and I want to thank you. And the last episode was with a, a counselor, and it was about coping strategies on lockdown. And it was really, really interesting. I mean, the rate at which the downloads uh, happened was very, very quick. And uh, I, I just want to thank you all from Australia to Venezuela, everywhere around the world. We are being listened to, and this is the right time to be a benevolent dictator. Uh, with no further ado, I want to introduce you to my next guest. This is someone who is feared amongst the <laughs> comedy industry. Uh, she is a personal friend. And let me tell you, as you know, how I do my podcast. I uh, just spoke to her yesterday evening. I said, what are you doing? I want you on my podcast. She thought I was going to give her a week. I said, no, I demand to have you on my podcast. And she's here with us this evening. Her name is Copy Copstick, and she is a Paisley Bond Scottish actress, television presenter, writer, critic, director, and producer. You see, she's best known for her roles on the children's TV shows Number 73 and Choco Vision. She also played Malin Mando in Malin Mando Investigates and performed as part of the ensemble cast of former Saturday morning BBC kids show on the waterfront. Why am I interviewing someone from BBC or who has worked from BBC? That is another matter. Copstick executive produced the natural born racist, racist TV series that followed the Virgin, bear with me, the Virgin Mobile Yamaha R6 Cop. Look, I don't know how long ago this was, but it feels really, really ancient. Copstick is also well known as a commentator on human sexuality. After years of writing for Erotic Review, she enjoyed it so much, the company. At the Angelo Fridge Festival, for those of you who remember, I used to perform in the Angelo Fridge before General COVID arrived. And I went there as a president rather than as a comedian. And I know that all these civilian comedians always worry about copstick. Copy is coming. Oh, what do I do? Blah, 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 blah. So she, uh, in 2003, I told you this is quite ancient. In 2003, she was a Perrier Comedy Award judge and a Malcolm Hardy Award judge in 2008 and 2015. She lends her voice to the announcements at Fort William. Look, there is a long, she has a long career history, but it's really, really important that I tell you what she also does as well, which is most recent, which is very, very dear to me as an African. She recently has been spending much time in Kenya, working with HIV plus women under families. So she has a charitable organization. And I will ask her about that. So with no further ado, and you might have noticed, some of you might not uh, see this because there's going to be an audio version, but if there's a YouTube version, she is quite Asian because the glasses that she's wearing <laughs> confirms it. <laughs> so with no further ado, I am so happy and I, I am so pleased. Look, I have to say to you that um, uh, Copy has become a very dear friend. For, for those of you who follow me uh, in uh, 2019, summer of 2019, there was an attempted coup and without Copstick or Copy actually providing the advice, I don't know how I would have survived the attempted coup. So I wanna thank her for that. So with no further ado, how are you, my dear friend? How is it going? How is lockdown treating you? What's been happening? Well, I, I feel, what can I say? Ancient is how I feel. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I re, am I allowed to swear, Mr. President, on your podcast? You, you can swear, you can, whatever, uh, that, whatever you want to do, just do well, whatever this, you want to do. I fucking hate lockdown. I am, 
I'm not a person who takes naturally, as you as a dictator will understand, I don't take naturally to being told what to do. I especially do not take well to being told what to do by fucking Muppets that really don't know what they're talking about, that pick and choose what science to follow, and that change their minds every five minutes. I, I am I am hate I am aging exponentially with the stress of being forced to live a life uh, dictated, as it were, by by people for whom I have no respect, uh, for whom I did not vote. I mean, I realize that voting is not that important to you, but in this country, it's kind of a tradition that we have, which I think we can all now agree gets us fucking nowhere. But, uh, you know, I didn't vote for them. I don't like them. I don't respect them. I think in so many ways they're wrong. And yet uh, my everyone's life is now circumscribed by their appalling mishandling, jobs for the boys, money for my mates, and let's not worry about what happens to the poor people. Hopefully they'll all die as long as my mates get richer. Um, I am loathing lockdown. I wish I had known that you had such a fascinating podcast on coping mechanisms, because at the moment, my coping mechanisms include um, shouting fuck at the wall a lot, <laughs> uh, kicking things, uh, breaking things, very, uh, just, I, I think the longer uh, this goes on, uh, I may well get to stones in the back garden, but anything that I've had that, wasn't, that was neither nailed down nor particularly dear to me has pretty much been smashed to smithereens. I, I find that destruction mm. is a great coping mechanism. And of course, uh, the old fail-safe favorites of drink and drugs. So um, I, I, I'm really not, I'm not a good enough, well enough, strong enough person, I'm sure you are, Mr. President, to go in for any of this wellness shit, yoga, <laughs> uh, counting my blessings, uh, Zoom glasses of wine with someone on the other side of the fucking country pretending that it's great fun, it's not, great fun, uh, it's yeah. just not. Can you imagine the caliber of podcast we could create if we were in the same room, but we're not. No. I'm on my sofa looking at a postage, well, I'm not happy about looking at myself at all, but looking at a postage stamp of you, trying to get excited about interaction. And it's just, quite frankly, it's just not happening. It's like the difference between properly great sex and just wanking yourself off to something <laughs> on the board. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. In a nutshell, I'm not enjoying lockdown and I'm not particularly coping well. No, I'm, look, I'm really sorry to hear that. And I would recommend, because the last podcast was about coping mechanisms from a, a yeah. counsellor. And uh, I know how you feel about yoga and wellness. But there were a couple of things I think might help you. But, okay, um, lay them on me. Sorry? I said, lay them on me. Do they involve Do they drink involve... drugs or masturbation? No, no. There are no drinks, no drugs, no masturbation, but more. <laughs> more, more, more wellness. <laughs> Look. Um, you, you're, not, you're not engaging me. You're, you're not. Okay. What are they? If there's no drink, no drugs, and no masturbation, how are they helping me? Do they involve violence? They don't involve violence. What I would say to you is that I've only spent, who knows, not even up to five minutes of the podcast. I can see that you are very, very angry about the lockdown. Very, very angry. And you I'm, know, I'm volcanically angry, and it's difficult to explode to the extent that I want to in a one bedroom Shepherd's Bush flat. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I'm, I'm just, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. Mm. And, I, and you know, I don't mind nightmares. I don't mind, you know, um, doing shit I don't like to help others. Fucking hell, I spend half the year in Kenya living in, you know, uh, you know shitting in, fetid holes in the ground, 
you know, <laughs> it, it's it's not, and you know, anyone who uh, has known me for any length of time knows that I am all for a bit of suffering. Mm -hmm. I love recreational suffering. Mm -hmm. There are many of my favorite clubs specialize in recreational suffering. Mm -hmm. I have traveled long distances in order to recreationally suffer. Mm -hmm. But this is a different kettle of suffering. Uh, and it, it's just so much of it, not so much, I think I don't react well I, we are creating uh, 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 a huge slice of society who go around the place chanting stay at home, save lives to themselves. And, and that, after months of chanting it, you start to think, oh, I'm a hero staying at home. No, you're fucking not a hero staying at home. Yeah. If the government had handled it properly, you wouldn't have to stay at home. And if you are negative, if you don't have COVID and you're staying at home, how is it? You're, you're not working, you're not doing anything. We need to be getting, oh, I, uh, I've had nine COVID tests, all of them negative. I'm not saying that you can't become positive the day after you have a COVID test. Yes, yes. I'm saying that if we, that there are options to staying at home thinking you're a fucking hero. Mm -hmm. we, we are turning people into little units of smug, going, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I haven't been out since 1973, <laughs> saving lives. It's, and we are, we're turning people against one another. Yeah. You know, people are being spat at if they're, I don't know, walking too fast or too slow or too close to someone else or, you know, in I'm I'm going to Kenya on Monday, and you know what? It's so much better there, because and they, for a start, I mean, there's much less COVID there, but that's not necessarily an accident. What they have, endless. Vit I'm pointing at my ceiling here. Endless uh, vitamin D, natural vitamin D, yeah, and everything. Well, a lot of things is outside. If you look at the stats in Kenya. There's more people, middle class people, who are inside, in offices, in mm -hmm. buildings, mm -hmm. who are becoming positive than manual labor, like our, my people. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is that terrible. Am I allowed to say my people? My ladies, yeah. Mama Biashara's ladies, yeah. uh, they keep telling me in Kenya that I'm black on the inside. I, they keep saying, you have a black heart. Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, there's a lot of comedians would say that as well, but not <laughs> Way. He has a duck heart. <laughs> exactly. Um, they're outside. You know, the markets are outside. You work outside. You teach outside. You walk outside. Mm -hmm. Loads of fresh air. Lo and it's, they've got a curfew, mm -hmm. which is about as much use as a pair of chocolate knickers, I, mm -hmm. I think, because the virus can't tell the time. I mean, it's not wandering about going, oh my God, look at that. How the time flies, it's unbelievable. It's almost 10 o'clock already. I'll have to be getting out there. Mm -hmm. um, but because they haven't chopped and changed a huge amount, the people generally are obeying the curfew. Mm -hmm. uh, people are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there is an appalling level of, or there has been, it's not as bad now, uh, police brutality. Mm -hmm. uh, um, are you are you in favor of police brutality? Uh, I, I think I think there are so many ways you can deal with uh, getting people to fall in order without police brutality. I, I I'm not sure really? if you I'm not sure if you've looked at or been following Uganda, where there's going to be some elections. And, yes. Um, it's been really horrible. And I know yeah. maybe maybe I'm getting so soft because of the being under house arrest, because as you know, I came on a state visit and I've not been able to leave to go back to Laughter Republic. It's the first time a civilian prime minister is putting me under house arrest. So that's a nightmare. You, I hope you're taking vitamin D supplements because uh, you you need them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But just touching on some of the points you made, and you've made that comparison because you would have thought that Kenya would disobey their governments. Don't you think um, that it's more about democracy is really what I call a virus because it's it's so mixed up in terms of oh yes you can go out or you can't it's so confusing the comment it's either the strategy should be as far as I'm concerned lockdown and it's lockdown yeah right. that, that is that. Just, you see, it's easy for you to say that because you're under house arrest yeah you're under house arrest anyway if they find a cure for COVID tomorrow you're still under house arrest. So it's bugger all to you whether the rest of the country, it just makes you feel better, forgive me for saying, but it makes you feel better about yourself if everybody else is under house arrest as well. You, I tell you what makes me feel better is watching TV and watching how terrible your leaders are, watching how oh. confusing, uh, you know, and, and what really frustrates me is is the fact that people say, and this is where I disagree with you, you talk about the lockdown. As far as I'm concerned, this is not really a lockdown because you can still criticize your government. You can still go out and exercise. You can still go out to the shops and do you understand what I'm saying? Then no one is really monitoring you like they do in China, like they're doing all these dictatorial regimes where you know if you're out, they know you're out and they stop you. There are people who are actually breaching um, the, 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 the civilian, what I call civilian rules and regulations, and they haven't made it any easy for themselves. Um, apart from the fact that you've had, you have an incompetent government, you also have some people who are breached. And I, look, I, I sympathize with the fact that this is not something you are all used to. You feel that your freedoms have been taken away from you, but you still have, you still have a chance to protest. You can still go out there and protest against your government. Now, there's a couple of things there I'd like to unpick. Please. As they say. <laughs> um, uh, number one, one of the, I totally agree about our government. I think they are the most toxic and destructive imaginable mix of incompetence and evil. Um, I, I think there are truly, truly evil people in this government. And I think, I mean, it's been, we're almost in um, Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake, which apparently she didn't even say, but we're in that kind of territory where uh, people are, they, they are so, I mean, did you see, did you see what they're giving mothers for a week or 10 days of dinners for their kids? Look, you know, when I saw that, I was really horrified. At one point, I thought I was hallucinating because I haven't had that much human interaction. And I saw the photo and I said to myself, I know Brexit, this is the second week of Brexit, are things that bad? that that's what they're giving children but also you know as far as i'm concerned you've been to kenya and what what, what most of these western countries do is they say that these african countries are corrupt then i find out the person who runs the company is linked to the government so there is white corruption which is acceptable which i would call white privilege but when it comes to black corruption is all and uh, there's your former no, prime minister massive. your former I mean, prime I I think up to a point, let's face it, uh, the English or, or the British had so many years in, in Kenya. Who do you think taught them corruption? Definitely, Who taught yeah. them police brutality? And you know, what's it, really, you know what's really interesting is David Cameron was caught many years ago. I can't believe he's mm. still roaming around the streets and giving us lectures uh, that Nigeria is fantastically corrupt. But if if you if it was a situation where the person who is responsible for giving out food parcels is linked to the government isn't that big corruption Massive. Not even, not, we're not talking you know linked <laughs> he gives them money yeah he gives them money and that's all i mean all of these big companies well you've seen i'm sure uh, lots of your guests have talked about the levels of corruption uh, in you know the government giving you know they give oh 
Yeah, I say, old chap, remember, you know, we, were, we did sixth form geography together. Now <laughs> I'm running a dildo making company. Oh, never mind, never mind. That's fantastic. You can make PPE. You, mm. It's the, the, the levels of corruption that we've seen have been horrific. And what is more horrific is that we haven't had a revolution. Yeah. No, we, what... it, when will the proletariat fucking rise? Because it's kind of the only way out. We're, we're not going to vote our way out of it. I'm a Jeremy Corbyn fan, uh, by the way. We're not going to vote our way out of it. Look what we've got as an opposition. Keir fucking Starmer. <laughs> Again, chocolate knickers. Uh, so we're not going to vote our way out of it. Um, I, and I don't know, it would, if you, uh, Mr. President, or a, a friend of you, somebody you could recommend as a dictator, uh, might want to come in and and, and fill the the void. Uh, that is one possibility. But another possibility is just the proletariat rising. And, and you know, I don't have you uh, just in terms of, of what you said uh, a few minutes back about. Um, people uh, having only themselves to blame because there were people flouting the laws of lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you will ever have heard of a guy, probably not, I'm going to fling his name out there, um, Martin Luther King. Of course, why would I? You've heard of, yeah. That's all. I have a dream. I'm so glad. Yes, I'm I have so a dream. glad you have. <laughs> uh, because he said, and to be fair, he wasn't the first to say it. St. Thomas Aquinas said it. Mm. Uh, a couple of other Greek philosophers said it, but then most recently Martin Luther King said, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, a bad law is no law at all. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the same way with St. Thomas Aquinas. They went, if a law is bad, there is no moral compunction to follow it. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, in a lot of those cases of the philosophers, what they meant was... Uh, if you read the Bible and it doesn't seem to agree with the law, then you don't need to follow the law. But, you know, it, it's, there's all these, uh, there's a lot of legal standards to do with the reasonable man, reasonable man the man on the clap of omnibus, the, the decent man. And I think that if a reasonable, decent man is going to look at a law and go, well, this is just stupid, not, some mental extremist, not someone who's going to say uh, there's no apost the, the apostrophe is in the wrong place, although that drives me mad. Someone who is informed, rational, and decent as a human being is going to look at this law and go, this is just pants. Hmm. Then I think there's an argument for not following that law. Okay. Question I, I, as a dictator, of course, you're not going to agree with that. No, definitely not going to agree with that. I think I think your government is weak, very, very weak in terms of how it has dealt with the pandemic. I think there have been mixed messages. Uh, it's almost confusing. One minute it wants to be a dictator, the next minute it wants to be democratic. There's some confusion there. It's it's it's. I don't understand what is actually happening. But let's go back to the revolution because. The last time Britain ever had a revolution was, if I remember correctly, was in the 16th century or something like that. There hasn't. Okay, no, so we yeah. haven't been very proactive on yeah. the, and, and you're you're talking about actually people rising. So yeah, that yeah. doesn't the industrial revolution and the agrarian yeah. revolution. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. People rising, the peasants revolt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Britain's the, not very, no, Britain's not very good no. at, as, as, a, as, as a partner, I describe Britain like very submissive. And that's why I believe that Britain is ready for dictatorship. Because you, uh, you, 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 <laughs> you, if you remember, the government, this same government, ordered you guys to go and clap for the NHS. And you did that regularly. <laughs> like, like seals. <laughs> like seals. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I think people are, with the, with the clap for the NHS, it started as a decent idea, mm -hmm. you know, with one person. This is the other thing, Mr. President. I, 
believe that no idea really or or no method or anything no method no no form of uh not companies not charities not organizations not nothing is good mm -hmm. i'm not quite sure where the tipping point is but we have a one size fits all mentality mm -hmm. we have a bigger is better mentality mm -hmm. we have unless everyone's doing it it's not really mm -hmm. the thing to do mm -hmm. mentality and that is evil that is evil mm -hmm. it we're not and, and more and more and more with uh, the, the way we're going and you can see it on social media if you don't conform to not even the, well, to the norm or to the to the most powerful, the most vocal opinions, you're not just a dissenter, you know, because um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a, she, she, she based her status as a, as a, a world heroine or a, a, on dissent, mm -hmm. but you're not allowed to be just a dissenter or to be other you are then an enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're wrong. You're a wrong thinker. You are you are the other. You're an enemy, mm -hmm. and that I think is a is a terrifying thing. And the government are using that. They're using. They are to use a ghastly Americanism, if I may. They're weaponizing fear. Mm -hmm. They're going. This is COVID. You're all going to die, unless. You know, you stay at home, save lives. Um, and that's the only way. And there is no other way forward. We're not even going to talk about other ways forward. Uh, this is our science from our sage guys, handpicked, uh, and, and a couple of other scientists who we will again choose. Um, if you and people who don't agree with that, because the mess, the, the message that this is the only way to save your life, mm -hmm. the only lifeboat is a government lifeboat, and you know, HMSS uh, UK is sinking in a ghastly tsunami of unknown of viruses and their new mutated offspring. Mm -hmm. So anyone that's not in a government lifeboat is regarded not just as somebody who said, hey, I've got a, I've actually got a, a life belt and a pair of water wings. I might be able to swim to shore. They're regarded as an enemy. And that, that is terrifying. So the government, you again, you were saying earlier about the government not being particularly hard line on those who who flout their rules mm -hmm. you don't have to for once in their misbegotten fucking lives they've done something very clever which is they have weaponized the public mm -hmm. they don't need to come down heavily mm -hmm. on people who flout the rules mm -hmm. other people will come we'll down yeah. on people who flout the rules mm -hmm. uh, they will come down heavily on them irl uh, they will come down heavily on them on Facebook, on Twitter, on this, on that. They'll post their photographs. Oh, look, I saw him posting a letter and he didn't have a, he didn't have a mask on. The fact that there was no one within 100 yards of the fucker doesn't seem to matter here or there. Yeah. They've weaponized people's fear. Neighbor, neighborhood, watch, neighborhood watch schemes are now COVID neighborhood watch schemes. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and weaponizing fear... Uh, now, who did, there was a guy, what was his name, Adolf something, did that. It worked up to a point quite well for him, but that's what they're doing. And I can't believe, intelli obviously, nobody who's going to be listening to this podcast, because your listeners and followers are, by definition, intelligent, free-thinking spirits who have chosen to follow uh, the benevolent dictatorship of you, Mr. Yeah. President. But there are people who seem otherwise 
intelligent that are, are, are just following blindly because they're frightened. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying, oh, it's all a conspiracy. It's, of course, it's not a fucking conspiracy. I'm not saying it can't be deadly. Of course, you now have to look at the hospitals. I'm not saying that Bill Gates is trying to microchip chip everybody. Fuck's sake, we're already microchipped. You know, hello, that's, <laughs> that ship has sailed. <laughs> Uh, they know everything you're doing. And so it's none of that, none of that at all. It's all real. And the vaccine is just a vaccine. Okay, it hasn't been tested sufficiently. But we are, am I even allowed to say the situation is being made very black and white? Or, or is that uh, a, a, a racist saying now? No, I, I, you know how I operate. Um, the difference between this podcast you're a civilian, freedom of speech. I'm not going to contest, say whatever you, you, you're thinking. Yes, but I don't want to say black and white and then find out that people are putting stones through my window. Yeah. I, I need your advice on this. As, as a person of color, as a dictator of color, is it okay to say it's a black and white situation? Yes, it's okay for me. I, I'm comfortable with that. The president has spoken listeners okay. and viewers the president has spoken i've got a question for you you we've had well over 15 minutes of what i will call uh a caustic rant over <laughs> over the lockdown i was trying to be mild mannered <laughs> in podcast. you have broken the record in terms of the number of swearing on my podcast but that is good that is good question i'd like to say i'm sorry but i no, no, you, 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 no, you have to express how you feel. And I know there's a lot of anger out there. And like I said, the government hasn't helped in any shape or form. The title of this podcast is If Comedians Ruled the World. I know you are not a comedian. I know you're a comedy reviewer. You're a comedy lover. I don't know whether you tried comedy before, but... No, I'm not. <laughs> or maybe you're a failed comedian. I don't know. <laughs> Many people have said that after spending the night, yes. <laughs> But we will talk, we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about comedy. But on this particular subject, based on the fact that you're angry, based on the fact that you feel that government is incompetent, based on the fact that you believe, that you, you definitely believe that the government is corrupt, if you were in charge, what would you do differently? Because let me say this to you. My friends in China are in, tai, are in Taiwan. We're not hearing anything about COVID. Actually, on New Year's Eve uh, in Taiwan, they were in the, the almost like Travada Square, getting ready to, to celebrate New Year. And this is what I don't seem to understand because for me, it's given me an opportunity to compare democratic governments and dictatorial regimes. So when I look at China and look at how they have responded to COVID and I look at Britain, I mean, this has been well over a year, 100,000 deaths already. And it's rising. One minute they want you to stay home, next minute they want you to stay home. The message, what would you do? And I'm not asking you to choose whether you will go the democratic way or the dictatorial way, but if you were in charge, what would you do differently? How would you respond to what is such a, 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 a critical time for Western countries? Because it, as far as I'm concerned, Copstick, it shows that democracy is a virus. It's there is a weakness in the system. Mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, you, what would I do differently about COVID? Yeah, what would you do differently if you were in charge of the world? Yeah. If you were prime minister, what would you do differently? You're complaining well, about prime the minister, lockdown. Prime minister is sticky because, uh, you know, you're kind of democratically elected. But if I ruled the world, uh, in general, Generally, no one would be allowed to make money from money. No more people who don't have real jobs, you know, like uh, the hedge fund this and, or, or if economically that was absolutely necessary, then anyone who makes money from money would be taxed at 70% minimum. There would be a wealth tax. There would be, there would be proper representation of the little people. Absolutely no decisions could ever, ever, ever 
be taken at ministerial level when they affect the little people. So we would never ever have somebody turning up, the government handing out a used Tesco carrier bag with a little bit of carrot and the stub of a cigarette in it and going, there you go, that's a week. They, they don't, these people who are not real people um, don't get to say. The word protocol will be banned. The word system will have very restricted use. Um, all, all decisions made about any group should be fully um, informed by that group. So if you're going to make decisions about single mums, fucking ask the single fucking mums. Because some chinless twat in a government office has got no idea what they're talking about. Nobody should be allowed into the House of Commons unless they've had a real job, a proper job, an actual job. Not in the city, not, no, no, no. Not making money from money, proper job. So they understand. With COVID, it's too late now, we're fucked. But uh, right at the very beginning, February, I would have been stockpiling or I would have been putting money into testing kits. Testing, 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 testing. So you know who needs to stay at home. You get, even if you have to get tested every day or every week, eventually, the, if only the, the people who have tested negative are like, you test negative, you can go to school. You test negative, you can go into the office. You test negative, and then you're there. It's like going on a plane. The one thing you know, when you get on a plane for my flight to Kenya, everyone on that plane has tested negative, including uh, the cabin crew. Every single person on that plane has come in clutching their little certificate that says, I've tested negative. And although we're getting a, a, a lot of false positives, I, I haven't really heard of anyone getting a, a false negative. So you create safe spaces that just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you don't end up with people fucking sanitizing their postman before they accept, you know, a birthday card. And I mean, how long is it going to be before people, your, your counselor person, whoever that was, they're going to make a fucking fortune because people are going to be agoraphobic. They're going to have all kinds of hang-ups and phobias. But uh, so I would go, I would have gone down the, let's just fucking test the living daylights out of everybody as often as possible to make sure that shit can still happen, but it is happening with and by people who are testing negative. The, the test and trace app was like, well, I don't know. I mean, they gave it to, you know, somebody's best school chum or something, of course. Oh, Baroness, fucking what's her name? Dido Harding. None of it was fit for purpose. None of it was made by the kind of people that were supposed to be making it. So you, uh, if the, if the, testing had even fucking happened and the tracing had worked, we would be in a radically different situation. And even Kenya, even Kenya for months has said, well, almost a year, they've said, you don't get in without a clear COVID test. That doesn't, you know, I don't think people would object to being tested on a you know, regular basis, mm. the way they're objecting to being told to stay at home and save lives. Yeah, yeah. So I would do, but mainly all of this could be paid for by massive taxation on people who make money out of money. They are bad people. They are evil people. You were baring your teeth there. Was that somebody in your room? Or was no, it me? no, I, 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 um, I was just listening to what you were saying and you sound very, I like your policies, but you sound very authoritative. It's very, we will do this, we will do that, we will do this, we will do that. Hello, I'm talking to a dictator. Yeah, 
yeah. I mean, I would have thought you would have approved. No, no, I, I no, I, I, I'm getting used to you, civilians. I'm getting used to because mm -hmm. the more I talk to you, the more I. Uh, but what about why? Why couldn't Britain have a revolution now? There's been so many trigger points. There's been Brexit. Um, there's been COVID. There's been the corruption. There are so many examples of where the rich are getting richer. The poor are getting poorer. It's become really transparent that it's, as you rightly pointed out, when you look at the politicians. Uh, one, one of the things I mentioned recently is um, I was watching Andrew Marr's show on Sunday. Ooh, get you. Yes, mm -hmm. and I just noticed, it was just a, it just triggered, but how come, as you rightly pointed out, all these career politicians are constantly being interviewed, but the people who actually are impacted by their policies we never see them on TV being interviewed to talk about the impact of for the health policy or, or the food policy. The woman who tweeted about the food package, if it wasn't mm. because of um, Twitter, no one would have found out about it. The that is very true. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, There's something- score, score one for social media, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Score one for social media. That, that, that I, I like about them. So but what is it because people are just so used to, oh, I'm gonna ask you a question. You might disagree with me in terms of what happened in America, but, but that was almost almost a revolution. Almost, Correct. Almost a revolution. Could that happen in Britain? Apart from the guns, yes. I, I, I think that our almost revolution was the Brexit vote. Mm. I really do. I think that uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of people who voted uh, leave, mm -hmm. working class people. And the, re the reason, the, the charge that kind of got them over the hump to go, yeah, we should get out, was really the, the loathing of the political elite and the the media elite and the theatrical elite and the the kind of people with no real jobs elite who were saying oh well obviously if if, if you vote leave you're just an idiot you're just mm. you're just absolutely but absolutely that gets people angry mm. no one no one i don't think i certainly didn't hear them had a meaningful, non completely irritatingly patronizing discussion with people who wanted to vote leave. They, mm -hmm. it, they were just very much like uh, COVID deniers or people yeah. who, who flaunt the legislation. They were just immediately and totally painted as uh, idiots, uh, undereducated, wrong thinking bad people, there was no real attempt made to go, okay, yeah, I mean, I think you're wrong, but tell me more. There was just, again, back to, they, they seemed to get uh, <laughs> the wrong sort of politician, but um, they, they didn't, they didn't particularly paint Brexiteers in a, a favorable, that's the wrong word, light. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of the, or, or even, you know, because we're talking revolution. Revolutions are not pretty. And sometimes you really don't agree with the person that wins. Mm. French Revolution started, you go, yeah, I can see what they're going at. I can see, bloody hell, yeah. And uh, the, the, the whole system, needs a revamp, it needs this, it needs that. Uh, I don't think the, the people at the very beginning uh, were ready, you know, the, the students on the barricades previously, anything like the people who were kind of like, no, we want freedom, we want a say, we want to matter, we deserve to matter. I don't think that all of them would have been beheading anyone with an income of over, you know, 25 and a half sous <laughs> per year, uh, you know, or a posh name in a castle. It, 
And the same with the Russian Revolution. One of the things with revolutions is they tend to run away with themselves. Mm -hmm. And albeit the, the idea at the start, which is, you know, government of the people, by the people, for the people. And then once, if the, if the revolution is successful, then what you've got is a kind of non-elected dictatorship. Uh, the people who, re who led the revolution, yeah, <laughs> the people who led the revolution, and it's very much potluck whether they turn out to be good, you know, once they're in power, whether they turn out to be good guys or bad guys. I have some friends now who I spend a lot Obviously, we all spend a lot of time late night in pubs in Edinburgh Used when to. the festival <laughs> is going. And, um, you know, there, there, there is even an argument to be made uh, for anarchy in, in some small way, in that anything else eventually resolves itself into some sort of dictatorship. Mm. Um, either uh, either an honest dictatorship or a dishonest dictatorship. I mean, electoral systems can be rigged, votes can be bought. Um, there hasn't been since uh, Kenyan um, uh, Kenyan uh, liberty, Kenyan freedom, uh, there hasn't been a Luo or a Luya or a Maasai president. It's turned into a kind of, uh, you know, one one nominates the next, nominates the next, nominates the next. And I'm not sure that's what the people who fought mm. to get the British out. I'm not, they didn't, in fact, I know they didn't mm. fight for what they've got mm. now. If you talk to very old people, even older than me, Mr. Mm. President, you talk to really ancient Gracious. people, Ken, I mean, people <laughs> who are 90, people, mm. I sat and talked to a gentleman who fought with the Mau Mau. He's the father of a friend of mine called Dan the Man. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan the Man drives a mm -hmm. sort of a taxi. Um, and his father fought with the Mau Mau and said to me, if he knew what Kenya would have turned into, he wouldn't have fought. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, not exactly be careful what you wish for. But I think that all the bright, brave young things who lead the leap over the barricades, you know, give them a corner office and, you know, the chance at a big salary and uh, allowing their girlfriends to be the secretary of state for something. And, you know, power, as they say, corrupts and absolute corrupts. power corrupts, absolutely. But more importantly, power corrupts because not everyone gets to absolute power but any amount of power mm. kind of corrupts and that kind of leaves us with anarchy which i'm not sure how do you feel about anarchy mr president i love it <laughs> but you're a dictator well, yeah i need it's needed it's needed ah but so you can rise them out of it uh, yes exactly i got a question for you uh, you mentioned Kenya, and I know that you do a lot of work in Kenya, and I've been following the, the charity work that you do, so well done for that. Why Kenya? What, what brought that on? Uh, oh, one of the words uh, I would probably ban as soon as I assume complete control, if that's okay with you, sir, mm. um, it would be, I hate the word charity. Okay. Um, it sounds so... Patronizing. Amazing. It really sounds, oh, I mean, it really has got that white saviory vibe. Yeah, yeah. It. Um, but I don't know what else. Oh, shit. Hang on. I need to plug myself in. My battery is running low. Hold you on. See, this is what happens in a democratic country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are waiting for um, Copstick. It's quite possible that her. Uh, Computer is uh, very ancient, um, but we have uh, lost her, and um, you're left with me. 
uh, it feels like there's been a coup because her screen is now frozen, literally frozen, and um, literally frozen. And uh, we will wait to see whether she comes back. Actually, this this feels like this feels like a coup. It reminds me of the time when the West tried to assassinate me uh, while I was about to. Um, uh, yes, we, I think I have um, lost her, and um, I'm hoping that she comes back. Um, in the meantime, uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed what we've been talking about. Um, it's obvious she went into uh, a rant, uh, a rant about uh, the lockdown, and she clearly isn't coping um, very well. Um, and then we went into what is wrong with society and what is wrong with governments. And we touched on corruption, we touched on uh, freedom um, of people, Bill taking away from them, and we spoke about revolution, which is very um, close to my dear heart. Um, she, I think, is back. Um, so I'm going to admit her back into the room. Uh, Copy is going to be back. Uh, we need your video. And yeah. yes, we Hang on. are there back. We go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Don't worry about it. I was blaming the fact that that wouldn't happen in a uh, under dictatorship rule, there will be constant. No, I'm sure it wouldn't. Uh, I'm sure it wouldn't. Just Anna, another, <laughs> a, a, another reason for letting you out of house arrest <laughs> and uh, into uh, the wider world. And you know what's really interesting is your was you were trying to sort out your laptop, mm. you, your your camera froze, so it felt like there had been a coup, but someone <laughs> has to. <laughs> So you just yeah. reminded me of the time I was delivering a speech. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I had can to... I ask, can I ask what you would do if, if you were in charge here? Of the United About... Kingdom? Yeah. I genuinely think that it would be a stricter lockdown. It, it's either one or the other. I will lock people up. It's as simple as that. I don't care how unhappy they would feel. I would lock them up. I mean, but what about, wouldn't you want to find out, first of all, if they had the virus or not? Of course, there will be testing. So there right. will, I'll you, get, we'll, you I'll, test I'll, I'll, I, will, I will get the army involved in testing. Yes. I will deploy Good. the army. I yes. will ban social media because I think social media, uh, as much as... Uh, yeah, I will. Because as much as I, I, uh, I understand that you live in a country for freedom of speech, People are posting everything. I mean, I remember writing about conspiracy theorists, and I mm. don't want to tell you the name of this comedian, but he writes to me, posts something on my inbox every time to convince me that there is this is conspiracy theory, and he's come up with all these examples. So I will ban social media because I feel but would you would you not would you ban his right to say what he believes? I will ban the right for information. I will ban the right for it. I genuinely believe that, you know, there are too many people writing things because people are gullible. People are genuinely gullible. Copstick or copy writes something about something and has, no, the other person hasn't done the research. Oh, guess what? This is what is happening. Blah, 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 blah. And it spreads like wildfire. If you're trying to control, as far as I'm concerned, if you're trying to control what is a pandemic, it's a crisis. There has to be one government. There can't be right now. It feels like. But they could be wrong. But We've listen already to me. established they're muppets. Listen to me. Listen to me. Right now, it feels like Britain feels like a football team. And you have Boris Johnson as the manager. And there are 60 million other people who want to be managers of Britain. It's not going to happen. It isn't going to. Oh, but, but surely you can have Boris Johnson as God help them manager, but you have to allow sixty million people to boo and hurl abuse and sing their songs. No, I think it's a distraction. Hey, Boris Johnson, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Boris Johnson. <laughs> I think I think it's a distraction. But let's move on because we've done a lot of politics. Oh, you're uh, a dangerous man, Mr. President. <laughs> 
You're an enemy of free speech. Yeah, I know. Look, it does not work. It poisons. Yes, Look, so, it poisons. It poisons people's minds. This is what is happening. That is why people cannot make up their minds. I, I have met people who can't think for themselves. They can't, there's no logical reasoning in Britain anymore. People read the papers and they regurgitate what they read rather than actually flipping it aside and thinking for themselves. So that is what- Well, you, you, what, think, you think it's best if they only have one, one kind of information to ingest and then flip it over and think for themselves. It offers stability. I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> I didn't tell why I did jazz hands. How appalling. Oh, I'm it so offers, sorry. Look, it offers stability. It, this thing has been going on for well over a year. Stability. And, and people have been confused for, 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 for since March. People don't generally know what to do. But let's move on because we're not going to be able to solve the political problem that Britain has. But you know, you have, you, you're a woman of many feathers and I want to talk to you about, <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about comedy. Oh, sorry, you were talking about Kenya. Yes, so we were, before that, we were talking about Kenya and I, I said, why Kenya? And you said, oh, uh, don't call it charity. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. So um, uh, I, in 1991, in a previous existence, uh, I was making documentaries for the BBC and I made the world's first documentary about HIV uh, and children, and I made it for children's television. Well, it went out at six o'clock. So uh, that took about two years to persuade anyone to allow me to, to make it, because of course you can't talk to children about HIV because they'll get it. That's basically the thinking. Anyway, they allowed me to make the documentary and uh, that was a mind opening experience. During it, during my research, uh, I met the team at St. Mary's Hospital. After the documentary went out, they asked me if I would be interested in coming to co-found uh, uh, a children's AIDS charity as kind of the person on the education end. So I said, yes. Over the years, over the next, 15, 16 years, we, we plowed away and the charity did okay. And there were about nearly 900, but only 900 uh, children infected in the UK and all apart from maybe a half dozen were black children. They were from sub, mostly from sub-Saharan Africa. We're not talking about nowadays. Nowadays, the demographic is different, but then that was, that was the 1990s. They were largely sub-Saharan children. So I said to the committee, why don't we go to sub-Saharan Africa and see if there's anything we can do to help there, especially me, you know, in my, uh, with my educator's hat on. And they went, no. So I went, oh, fuck. But then somebody, a, a marvelous man called Archie, whose wife was Kenyan and who had a son with her. Uh, his wife had died of AIDS. His son was HIV positive and he'd raised money, 500 pounds, and he wanted it very specifically taken to this particular slum area in Nairobi, in Kenya, where his wife had, uh, had ties. She had contacts and there was a woman there who was um, uh, doing a, a street children's feeding project. So I went with the donation and that is how I went to Kenya. I no, I had no idea about anything about Kenya. The only place I'd been in Africa was Morocco and I'm not even sure if that counts. Uh, so I was incredibly lucky because I went direct from the airport to a, a slum area and I met the people there I met the women there and fucking hell these I'd never met women like these I have a very bad reputation for being a woman hater and um I, I do have a hard time with uh kind of generally over privileged overthinking self-obsessed first world women I, I have very little time for me. Oh, you looked at me in a funny way. Eee, it was creepy. <laughs> Fuck off. Um, and then I went and met these women 
who, I mean, strength beyond my imaginings. You know, living in a hole in the road. And I just thought, fuck. And when women like that say, will you help us? I've, I have no idea how you would say no. Mm. I started with them, and that was 2006. 2008, generally helping out where I could. 2008, I was there during the post-election violence, and um, uh, Nairobi was on fire, and there was smoke everywhere and all the big charities were running away because their protocols dictated that people working for them couldn't be put in danger. Um, and my friend Felista, who was the lady who was running that project, said to me, oh, we must rescue the women. Okay. And she, so she explained that there was a, an area, it's a kind of a huge sort of park area called Jamahuri Park. And uh, in the bush areas of that, women with small children, that was kind of where they went to when their house was firebombed and everyone was shot and all hell was breaking loose. They would grab their youngest child, run there. So we went in the middle of the night to rescue these women. And uh, you have to go in the middle of the night because during the day, thousands of people there waiting for the stupid white people with the flatbed trucks with the big sacks of rice to come with their clipboards they basically stand on the back of the flatbed truck chuck off the 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 rice and flour tick yes we have delivered 10 metric tons of nutritional aid to Jamahuri park and then they fuck off and then the big guys the brokers uh rush in kick women, kick, you know, women and the really needy people out the way, which is easy because they're starving to death and they don't put up much of a fight, especially if you've got a starving child under each arm. They take the flour and the whatever, and they go and sell it. So absolutely no help to anyone. What? Uh, they've still delivered 10 metric tons of whatever. You go at night and it, night there's only the real people and I went uh, we're actually 12 children I find them very irritating yeah. but uh, they had to come with because it, apparently it would have been horrible to leave them there under a bush who knew mm. um, so we, we got the women somewhere to stay and the next morning I met up with them and we had tea and mandazi Mandazi are like the worst donuts you have ever tasted in your life. And Kenyans do a lot of terrible things with carbohydrate. Uh, and I was bricking it because I thought, well, yeah, 12 women, what am I gonna do? You know, like a, a warm handshake uh, and a blanket is not gonna fix what's happened to these women. Mm. So I just said, I thought, I've got to say something. And I, I said to them, how do you want me to help? Because I don't have a fucking clue. I didn't say that. They don't like swearing in Kenya, generally mm. speaking. Yeah. So I said, how do you want me to help you? And this woman said, we have been speaking. And she said, this is word for word, pretty much. Um, before the previous night, they had each had a small business. By small business, I mean one of them had sold knickers, one of them had sold gumawiki, uh, which is like kale, that small a business. Day by day, you make enough profit in a day to feed you for a day, and then you carry on the next day. So she said they'd each had a small business before the previous night. And she said, if she and I quote, if you can help us start the business again, we will take it from there. So it was, you know, talk about a light bulb moment. This was like a floodlight. <laughs> and I, you know, patronizing bitch that I obviously was, it never occurred to me that that's what they would say. So I went, 
okay. And then the Scottish is, Scottishness kicked in and I went, how much will it cost to start up a business? <laughs> and I had a pen, but no paper. I was like, um, what's his name? <laughs> uh, Pierce yeah. in uh, Momentum. Yeah. I had uh, um, Guy Pierce with, I had all the calculations up and down my lily white paisley skin and it worked out. And this was, uh, say, 2008, it worked out at just under 20 pounds per business set up. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've not really had life-changing moments till then. I've had a kind of, oh, that'd be a good idea. Or a, this is completely shit. I need to stop doing this moment. But this was a life-changing moment. I mean, I sat and went, okay, 12, uh, 20, 240 quid. So I can, because don't forget, I was a television producer, uh, porn and super bikes. <laughs> I thought, I, they pay very well. Um, I thought I can just go to a cash machine and get that money out. Mm. I never see ATM because in the world of porn, ATM means ass to mouth. Mm. And so I can, I just don't like using ATM anyway. So I went to a cash machine, got the money out, started the business. I still know some of these women now, but that was, you think, fuck, well, why isn't everyone doing this? It's just so obvious that the women have the, the, the know-how, they, they know these businesses, they know, you know, oh, go there with such a fucking a, a re, wrong idea of how, of what it is that, you know, the white West can give to Africa. They don't fucking need our advice about mindfulness and yoga. You really fuck it. You can be as mindful as you mm -hmm. like and still starve to death if you don't have a way of making money. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the, the, especially women's charities over there doing, yes, I'm woman, hear me roar. And they do all these workshops and everything. And then the women go home and get beaten by their husbands because they've, got, they've still got no way out. But as they are beaten and raped by their husbands, they're lying there thinking, I am strong. I am invincible. Um, I'm more practical. So I thought, this is, this is everything. This is, it's, it's about respect for the women. It's about understanding the abilities and the strengths that they have, that we don't have. Mm. You know, it, this is one of the things that people need to understand. My, my ladies, they could live my life in a heartbeat. Mm. They, 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 they died and gone to heaven if they came over here. And, and, you know, got some work in it here. You know, they still haven't got over the fact that I've told them that, you know, generally speaking, if you don't have work, the government will give you money. <laughs> you know, if you have a baby and you've got no money, the government I, will give you money. I, 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 interview, I interviewed someone they, they just, Yeah, Go on, mm -hmm. go on. Go on. I interviewed. Um, so these women are 10 times, you know, they are worth 10 times any of the nice white middle-class people that go over supposedly to help them. So just going, I know you're great. I know you're strong. Otherwise you'd be dead. And so would your children. You know what works in this place. I don't, I've just fucking flown in from a place, from a flat in, in Shepherd's Bush. It's got a central heating. It turns itself on automatically. So I don't get cold. Mm. So I don't know about having to go out into the forest where I'll probably be raped to get kuni to get what kuni, firewood to make a little fire and then not quite understand that if I cook inside, I'll probably end up with COPD. But so they do it, they do it all. And it's about respect for these women. It's about understanding their strengths and their knowledge. And it's about, um, one of the, the, you know, I keep applying for grants and I always get turned down, apart from all hail the Brothers Trust, who are, they've just been amazing. They're, they're small but mighty. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, I get knocked back for grants because they always want paperwork, tons of paperwork. 
They want to know who's on my governance committee. Uh, and they, they worry that I don't do enough follow up. Okay. Now, you know, aftercare, they call it aftercare. You go, the last thing my women want is me turning up at their new place of business, you know, going, how can I help? <laughs> Should we have a mindfulness moment? Mindfulness they moment. Really, they, you know, they just don't want me there. Mm. Some weird white old Scots woman. I, that, I'll just get people asking questions. Kenyans are very, very private. I, mm. I don't know uh, about people in the Laughter Republic, but Kenyans are very, very private. We wouldn't, we, we wouldn't even allow you into our country because we know really? what happens. Oh yes, definitely not. Why um, not? But we, we, you know, you know what happens. Colonization part two starts again. Well, I, I do try not to, to. I don't have that many servants mm. in in my room in Daggerty <laughs> Corner. Just the usual amount. Yeah. And I haven't partitioned off that much land. Yeah. Uh, in, in which to sunbathe. Yeah. But uh, so um. With, with the Laughter Republic, do you do your people have everything they need or want? They want they have everything and they have no idea what they're missing because we're shut down. Well, you know, you guys, this is what's really interesting. You talk about lockdown. Laughter Republic has been on lockdown since I became president, well over eleven years ago. So they yeah, have who's no looking idea. After the, yeah, who's looking after the shop while you're in lockdown here? Nah, it's it's all sorted, all sorted. I'm communicating with them online, and we are okay. yeah, they are happy. Happy. That's that is the strength of your power. Yes, the, and that's and that that's that is what your democratic leaders don't understand that yeah, you can achieve yeah. what I have achieved through democracy. Yeah. But I I I want to talk to you about comedy and the comedy industry. Uh, <laughs> what comedy industry? <laughs> Hello. If you have time, um, because obviously it's uh. It's not happening at the moment. A lot of it is online. What What have you heard? Um, what do you think will happen? I I dread the kind of the the future. I honestly, stupid idiot that I am, believed that everything would be okay this year. That we come back, and that the the for example that the fringe uh, and the comedy fringes would rise again. And I hoped that, um, you know, people talk about the great reset. I hoped that the great comedy reset in terms of festivals would mean that it would grow again from the grassroots because the people who just want to do their thing will do their thing mm. and, and not particularly mind um, other than their comedy ego will get dented if there's five people or six people um the, I, I believe that the the heartbeat of the comedy fringe is the free fringe mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other you know it, the people who who followed it um i kind of hoped that maybe the people who just see and let, let's just take Edinburgh as a as an example, because it's the biggest and uh, uh, allegedly the most prestigious. Um, the people that uh, just see uh, the Edinburgh Fringe as a cash cow, perhaps they might be the ones to die off, not literally die off, but their shows just not happen because them and their accountants and their managers and their publicists will be looking at the numbers and going, well, this just isn't adding up. I'm not going to get 10,000 a night, so I'm not going. I don't think they would be missed. I wouldn't miss them. I I kind of harbored a hope that, that it would take the fringe back to being a fringe, back to being, you know, you can't be that spontaneous or you won't get an audience, but back to being, um, back to basics, basically, for an overused phrase, and, and that, I kind of hoped that maybe when there was no money around to pay them to sit in an office and punch out a ticket, the the kind of uh, edifice of the fringe society would disappear because they 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 talk about themselves and they have talked about themselves uh, for a 
a few years as if they run the fringe and as if they're necessary to the fringe and as if the fringe can't happen with absolute bollocks. They're a fucking ticketing office. They are a ticketing office. And as I think most of us remember, sometimes a pretty shit ticketing office. So I thought that that kind of, you know, so they run hugging workshops in Fringe Central, whatever that big fucking deal. That is not worth getting whatever they got, half a million quid from the government. Um, I, I hoped that the edifices like that, people that are just making money out of the fringe while they are being there, you know, they don't put on shows, they don't run venues, they don't do anything. They, they do hugging workshops uh, and they do ticketing. Now, it's not rocket science. Um, there are many people who don't like them, but at least the people who run the big four, they do, they run their venues, they're there, they're on the ground. All of them are there all the time. All of them are hands on. All of them are hands on for the whole fringe. And if anyone knows how to get it back financially or commercially, they do. The Fringe Society needs to shut the fuck up and let people who actually know how to run venues and put on shows talk. It, it's basically um, what I was talking about generally. Don't ask somebody who is a, you know, a career administrator. They don't fuck all about anything apart from administration. Ask someone that knows how to do the fucking job. Sorry, I'm swearing again. Um, you need to have, uh, you know, like performers on, any, any, you need to listen to the people who are doing it because mm. they are the <laughs> tautological as it may seem, they're mm. the ones who know how to do it. Yeah. And nobody sat in an office knows how to do it. Mm. So, um, and, and in terms of the fact, you know, I, I think a lot of comics, I think they're having to change quite quickly. They, they structure their year around Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. You know, they write a show with a view mm -hmm. to going to Edinburgh, mm -hmm. doing marvellously in Edinburgh, and then touring off the back of their wild success in Edinburgh. I realise, Mr. President, you have presidential things to do as well. Mm -hmm. you, must have, you must have a lot of call on your time, foreign dignitaries, people asking for advice, mm -hmm. um, and obviously keeping your own country in lockdown from afar, uh, which I don't know how you, you do it all together, but the the... The terror for me is that um, Zoom gigs will be normalized. And that in the same way that we have a generation of children and whatnot growing up thinking doing shit online is like real life, comedy fans will forget too quickly that comedy is live. It's a live thing. Stand-up comedy is an intimate, live thing. It's person to person, it's the smell, it's the surround, even if that is somebody breaking a pint glass in the next venue. It's the sweat, it's the heat, it's the standing in the queue, it's the talking on the way out. It's being able, you need to see, you know, the whites or bloodshot as they frequently are, of their eyes and for the comic, you, I mean, tele comics get used to um, Zoom. <laughs> talking to talking to a lens, yeah. and I mean, I, I used to do tons, shitloads of um, television presenting, and I really liked it um, because on the the very few occasions I tried stand up, I was shit. I was absolutely terrible, and when you're shit as a comic. You're face to face with your shitness. <laughs> you have a room full of people there going, okay, no, she's shit. When you're doing it down a lens, everybody, you know, everyone's falling about the place laughing. In my mind's eye, there are people going, my God, why didn't we realize she was so witty and so good looking at her age? Um, it's not normal and it's not real mm -hmm. and it will change the way a lot of performers perform. I mean, I know the one-liner comics 
uh, their actual performance style isn't going to be as altered yeah. by doing it down a little white light mm -hmm. on your laptop. But still, you you miss that, you know, either the instant laugh or, as Jimmy Carr says, the most powerful thing there, <gasps> and then the laugh. Mm -hmm. You, okay, you can have, if you get expensive Zoom, you can have little boxes with people mm -hmm. in your front row, mm -hmm. not the same thing. It's just not. And if we come out of the end of this, and comics are more likely, comedy audiences are so kind of agoraphobic that it's not so much the comics because they're all, you know, slightly deranged, self-obsessed, desperate for love and adoration that they can smell and taste and if necessary <laughs> suck. Um, so they're, they're all desperate to get back on stage. But the audiences, I'm worried that the audiences will think, you know, it's really barassic out there and it's raining. It's going to cost me in 450 to get into London. Uh, uh, central London bar, it's going to cost me, you know, whatever for a couple of pints. And then even, and probably the show costs less than anything else you're doing that night. Mm. And, you go, and then you've got to think about getting back home on time I'm worried the audiences will get habituated to being couch audiences and it's easy and you just click. And if you don't like that, you click on something else. I'm worried about the effect on normal comedy audiences. Now, you know, people will always get up to go and see, you know, Jimmy or whoever, but for for new comics who are coming up, who need the experience in front of an audience you can smell, in front of an audience you can die in front of. <laughs> um, and and th those kind of mid-range comics who, they're not a massive pool. So I, I, I just think it's very dangerous that everybody has taken so easily and so quickly and so relatively enthusiastically to having their entire fucking lives on zoom on zoom <laughs> which is what we're doing right now so if I it correctly. It, it's not the same as i said it's the difference between a really good session and uh, a bad porno and a wank yeah 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 you've said that so many times <laughs> do, you, do you so you're saying that you do you think and fringe will come in one form of disguise but it's probably going to be online in the future. Oh God, I hope not. Okay. I really hope not. One thing which... I don't think it's going to happen this year though. President, I'm not liking you saying that. I, I The longer we go on and the more mm. incompetent this fucking government is, mm. you know, I, I, I can't see it because already, you know, let's face it, we're mid-January. Normally, People, you know, they would have venues booked, the mm -hmm. accommodation booked. I, I thought, oh, it would be awful um, to have another year with nothing. What disappointed me massively, the biggest disappointment to me last year was, okay, uh, it was like, oh, maybe we can do this. No, maybe we can do that. No, finally, Fringe is cancelled. And then towards the end of August, like the last week in August, something like that, the the, the ban on uh, pubs outdoors and everything was lifted. You could go into restaurants, mm -hmm, you could mm -hmm. go into pubs, all of that. Now, all of that meant- You could do Edinburgh. That in principle, you could do the last week of Edinburgh. Mm. Now, if you were doing, you know, uh, a zoological take on Chekhov's Three Sisters, then it's unlikely that you could get the, the animal costumes and the jungle set up <laughs> in time. But if you're a stand-up comic, you're basically a bloke standing in a room mm. talking. Into a microphone, possibly. If you don't have a microphone, then you're a bloke in a room talking slightly louder. Mm. There is no 
set up, know nothing. It's you and your incredible talent and your brilliant material. I'm talking about you personally here, President, Mr. President, of course. Thank you. Thank you. And therefore, all these, um, and, and I didn't understand why local comics who are always fucking mouthing off during mm -hmm. Edinburgh about how they are sidelined and marginalized by all these bloody comics coming up from the South and from America and whatnot. And why does nobody ever talk about Scottish comics? And nobody, nobody, <laughs> came nobody came to review me and I'm from Leeds. Well, they had a big chance. Mm. Nobody who didn't live in Edinburgh really would have had the cash to go, I'm going to go up there, get a hotel for a weekend and do it. None of the local comics lifted a finger. The only person who did anything was Nathan Cassidy, mm. who came up and did his show in the courtyard of the Three Sisters, which can't tell you how lovely it was. It didn't smell of beer and sick and death. Mm. It, it smelled quite nice. It, it was lovely. And the show was fine. Um, it was very extensively thought out and convoluted. And one of those shows where you think, mm, this is okay, this is okay, this is okay. And then at the end you go, fuck, that was very clever. So definitely worth seeing. I'm very glad I saw it. I was appalled that so few people turned up. So how many people? Very, very few. Very few. Mm. And that was the Edinburgh Comedy Fringe. Mm. Now, comics had been mouthing off about, you know, live comedy. There was a massive opportunity for local performers. And there was all these people who are, oh, I'm such a comedy fan. I'm devastated that the fringe is not happening. Where the fuck were you? Mm. So, and that was only after the first lockdown. Mm. Now we're on, you know, after we're on lockdown 22, and it will be like, stay locked in a cupboard, save lives. <laughs> um, stay locked in a cupboard, don't breathe, save lives. Yeah. Um, so I worry that um, starting again from pretty much nothing, it's hard, it's horrible, it's ghastly. Mm -hmm. And comics will have to, again, get used to the fact that they're gonna to have to build up audiences again, because mm -hmm. audiences are lazy bastards. And apart from the audience for this, of course, and if you can get something at the click of a button mm -hmm. with you know, a six pack of Stella from Lidl for you know, one pound 26, mm -hmm. then you know, they just might stand up live stand-up might not be the kind of life necessity yeah. that the generation of comics have got used to feeling like it is. You know, the reason why I said that I'm not sure about this year is when you look at how someone I will call your rival, Nicholas Todgen, has responded, always trying to outdo the English government. They've been more stricter in terms of the lockdowns. Yeah. They? Yeah. And that's my worry. They they have. I'm a fan of Nicola. Oh, great. Um, I am a fan of Nicola. Uh, strong woman, sensible woman, down to earth woman, uh, who I think does know a bit more about real life um, than the leaders down here. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I honestly don't know, but my conviction that it would all be fine next year is kind of very slowly deserting me. Mm. And um, maybe it's better that way as the great Stephen Sondheim wrote, um, if you have no expectations, you will never have a disappointment. Mm. Mm. And I, I just don't know, you know, on the one hand, it'd be terrible to, go like last year go ahead you're just convincing yourself that it's all going to happen and then the rug's pulled from under your feet but similarly in january to kind of go it's not going to happen is it and give up oh that's unthinkable yeah unthinkable. Maybe, maybe those who are listening especially the local comedians might take the opportunity 
um, this year if it's not going ahead and, and do something. Um, you are also known as, you know, I didn't really know anything about you. You know, when I started <laughs> performing, <laughs> when I started performing uh, and performing with all my presidential speeches, because I, I genuinely, my story, as you know, is, you know, I genuinely didn't see myself as a comedian. I just created this country, started delivering presidential speeches, and people were finding me funny. So when I took my first show to Edinburgh in 2015, I heard so much about you. And I said, who the hell is she? Why are you so worried about her? Good point. Good point. <laughs> you know, I, I had no idea why all these civilian comedians were so, you know, I said, oh, uh, and there might be a reviewer. Oh, Copstick is coming. Oh, it's Copstick. I'm only here to come and perform. Well, maybe exactly. it's the detect, maybe it's the detector in me. Um, but as I <laughs> but as my as as my as I went back, I understood were the important parts that you played, and you've had your you've had your challenges along the way. With uh, uh, I'm not sure if if I can compare you with um, Steve Bennett. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so well. But yeah, um, maybe I might be invited to this podcast after a very terrible he review he gave me the other day. I, I think um, Steve is somebody, he's a really lovely guy. Mm. He's a proper comedy nerd. Mm. And he started short, people forget. See, that's the thing. You get some 12 year old open spot who comes along and you yeah, well, Steve Bennett was an image rugby, he's such a twat. <laughs> Steve Bennett started Churchill off his own bat because mm. he loved comedy mm. and because comedians can never get enough fucking people talking about them and writing about them and throwing stars at them and whatnot. Um, and bit by bit by bit, it has grown and grown and grown and grown. Mm. And now people are very, people are, so many people are very negative about them. And he is an incredibly nice guy. He's a very very fair reviewer mm. whatever you know okay so he didn't like you whatever uh, oh you know he he has a much broader um uh comedy uh appetite mm -hmm. than people will people give him credit for mm -hmm. i've sat and watched some mental stuff with steve thinking mm -hmm. oh my god he's not really gonna like this and he's loved it he He's a thinker. Mm -hmm. He is, you know, unlike I'm all kind of fire and shouty and generally speaking, I'm like, ah, fucking brilliant. Or, oh my God, that was dreadful. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not remotely entertained by the middle ground. Mm. Um, and I think that I, I don't want to go and see a show, you know, I'm unfeasibly old, Mr. President, mm. and I don't have enough life left to go and spend an hour watching a show which, yeah, that was fine. Mm. I need better than fine. Mm. I need to feel something, either my gut or my crotch mm. or my brain <laughs> needs to be engaged and given a workout. Yeah, yeah. And if something's like, yeah, that was okay, then, you also have to contend with the fact that, um, you know, in certain venues in Edinburgh, you've probably caught some kind of fungal infection just by yeah. sitting there. And is it worth it? For a shit something? show. <laughs> Fine. I would rather always, always, always rather see somebody fling everything at the wall in a, in a genuine, valiant attempt, an honest attempt, than watch some smug cunt just going through the motions because that's worked before. Mm. Um, have you and, have you have you ever reviewed a show and then you've just thought, oh, I think I actually got it wrong? Um, no. No. Uh, okay. I I mean that that must sound really really smug and self satisfied. What has happened, and is one of my favorite things to happen, is when I review someone, and I, or I view, view a show and I think that's absolutely dreadful, absolutely awful, how appalling. 
And then I go back maybe five years later and you think, bloody hell, they've turned into something good. The best example uh, I can think of immediately being Alfie Brown. Uh, when he did his first show, I mean, he was he was very young. He was 18 or 19 or something. Mm. And Jesus Christ, what a uh, well, super privileged, opinionated little prick he was. I remember I was sitting there with Bruce Dessa and both of us were kind of <sighs> touching and... Mm. Um, and I gave him one star and he, it was just appalling. It was just... You know, I'm 19, I've done fuck all, and here's what's wrong with television and comedy today. You go, you don't get to say that, you smug little shit. <laughs> and I went to see him the next year because somebody that I had such a powerful reaction to, that's pretty good. Mm. That's pretty good. And also, there were people, I mean, he didn't exactly rip the place apart, but there were enough people in there laughing mm -hmm. to make me think, okay, what am I missing? Went the next year, it was definitely better. Went the next year, it was definitely better. I think it was the fourth show and he'd met uh, Jesse and uh, it, he just, like his balls had dropped. And wow, suddenly all the, the kind of intelligence and the, the, the verbal capability, the linguistic capability that he had that had been squandered on going, well, I didn't like this and nobody was channeled. And it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And he has been brilliant. He's got more brilliant ever since. And that's just, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to go, oh my God, my mind is changing. Mm. Um, but, uh, and, and I've, but I've never looked back and oh, one, one, um, there was, oh shit, I can't remember his name. Bollocks, an American comic. He was on an assembly room and he did a show about masculinity. I mean, this was like ancient times. Early, <laughs> early to ancient times. Um, <laughs> he wore a cod piece and a jester's hat. Uh, and I, what happens is the first shows that I see kind of set the bar. You know, if, if the first shows are the most difficult because you go and see something and you go, well, that was very good, but it wasn't great. It was very good. I will give that three because it wasn't exceptional and it certainly wasn't brilliant, but it was a very good show. Now that then becomes your three stars. If I see something the next day, or, or in the next, and so that becomes a three stars. And you're going, well, it, this wasn't as good as that. Uh, this was better than that. By the time you get to the second week, sometimes, you know, you're going, okay, in the light now of other things that I've seen, the review will not have changed. But sometimes you go, fucking hell, I can't give everybody three stars. It, it's it's the star system which is problematic. I would never change my review mm. I, I, that I remember. But sometimes you think by the time you get to the end of the fringe, yeah. you're going in the light of everything else that I've reviewed, that maybe could have been a three. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm boring, you know. No, 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 no. It, it's just um, I just looking at the time. Um, oh, you're boring me. We've we've broken the record in terms of oh. uh, in terms. <laughs> we said an hour, but we this has been fantastic because we've covered. Oh. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've done. How long have we been talking? Oh, we've been talking since uh, six o'clock. <laughs> I 
time now? 739. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> no, it's good. It's fantastic. You shut me up. No, no, the, no, no, no. I did the freedom of speech. You wanted uh, freedom of speech. I thought you were against freedom of speech. <laughs> but it's been it's been great. It's been great. Um so Sandy, um reviews, as far as I'm concerned as a as a dictator, reviews are just people's opinions more than anything Correct. else. And um, Correct. as important as they may be for civilian comedians. It's really interesting. What, one of the things I like about what you said is um, very similar to Steve Bennett. When he first saw me many, many years ago, I was doing a, uh, I was so naive then, I was doing a comedy competition for someone who said you could win a pound, you know, and um, it was, <laughs> <laughs> and it was in a pub. And um, Steve Bennett, yeah, and Steve Bennett was there, and I didn't even know who he was. And uh -huh. I saw the review a week later, and he said, President of Bonjo, and this was early days of my presidency. And he said, uh, it looks like he went on a bad comedy course. <laughs> now, you see, I laugh because a couple of years later, he then saw me at some comedy competi competitions and he then wrote um, uh, Great Comic Construct. You know, he had changed his views. But no, 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 no. It didn't change you. Yeah, changed. I know, I know, I know. I changed, and then his his views changed. Yes, that's what that's what I mean. No, no, no. His view of you then was the same. Yeah. But because you changed, his view changed. Yeah, 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 definitely. But what the point yeah, I'm trying it, the point I'm trying to make though is that comics they kind of feel that if you know I didn't like you three years ago, I won't like you now. You might be very different. No, oh, but there's a view. There's a view. I, I certainly know that there are um, not necessarily reviewers, but there are comedy bookers. If you die on their at their club, yeah. um, they immediately write you off. That's it. You're not coming back. Exactly. But but the mistake they make is that people grow. People make mistakes. Okay. People oh, uh, people develop. You know there is what you call personal growth and personal development. If you don't make mistakes, how do you then? You know because when I when I read his first review, I just said, "I'm going to prove you wrong, Mr. Bennett. I am Good. going to prove you Good. wrong." You know I didn't let it get to me. And that's what yeah. happens uh, with, with some of uh, the comedians. They let it get into their head and make it define yeah. who they are. So far, you have to be, Sorry? You are far too smart for that. Yeah, yeah. So far, you believe in yourself and you believe in your act. Yeah, he didn't like you and that's fine. He will like yeah. you one day, you know, but don't let that define you. And then you write yourself off and say, oh, I'm not doing comedy anymore because Kate yeah. doesn't like me, you know. But look. Or you know, you write the reviewer off when you go, they're just shit, they're rubbish. Nah, uh, you know, they're, nah. yeah, they're I, I, I have actually, what's really interesting when I came into the comedy game, there were a number of people whose names were mentioned, but not in, it wasn't in a beaching sense. It was more like, oh, this person, oh, he's so bad at reviews, blah, 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 blah. But it so happens that when I meet people, I can't really like them. You know, I just, they're just decent people. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that was not what a dictator should do, but. <laughs> <laughs> very true yeah. very true but um look this has been really fantastic and i you know it's it's been so wonderful i i said to you one of the things i'm gaining from this is the art of conversation you know uh -huh. and uh, it's 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 been it's been fantastic and uh, you are off well, to it's, be, it's been a great honor yes I, I i i i i'm sure this is the first podcast that you've been to that has been organized by a dictator you've never been interviewed by a no. dictator before no yeah. i have so, so we will make it a fast that when because you've never ever reviewed me never ever reviewed not, any not of my yet. shows yes not yet. <laughs> so, so who knows who knows what will happen but i hope i hope because i miss i have to say i miss mm. edible fringe i had uh, i had an audience i had uh, it became almost cultish like trump people just Genuinely mm. love the act, and uh, but it's what it is. We we are, and this is one of the reasons why I do this. I'm now, mm -hmm. yeah. I you know two years ago I attempted cool. Now I'm doing Zoom podcast. You know, career, exactly. comedy comedy career going very the well. The only way is up. <laughs> the only way is up. So on that note, I want to wish you uh, because I you know I don't take this for granted. You spent well over an hour of your time, and I really do appreciate it. I hear you're off to um, Kenya. Uh, yeah, on Monday. Uh, on Monday. Uh, uh, stay safe. Uh, you never know. 
you never know because it, it, <laughs> you never know what's going on because you might come back and maybe there might be a new government and you can't get in. But uh, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Would you would you like me to sound out the Kenyans uh, in case they are they're looking for a new president? How is the Kenyan president doing? I think he's doing well, isn't he? Terrible. Terrible, yeah. Well, it's you know, if you're Kikuyu, then he's doing wonderfully. If you're Luo, he's doing terribly. And that's the tribes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I'm closely watching uh, Uganda's uh, elections because there's a young man called Bobby Wine, Ooh. who is supposed to be ah uh, in Uganda. Yes, yeah. in Uganda, and he's been arrested. His wife has been stripped naked. And, yep. you know, and it's not like I'm getting soft as a dictator, but I think there are ways you can fix these elections without being brutal. You know, there mm. are ways around how you can rig elections. Mm. And what mm. is frustrating for me is all these uh, leaders like Trump, Museveni, they're all talking about the elections are being rigged. What happened to the days when the incumbent will fix the election? You know, just fix it. <laughs> and those were the days. Those were the days, you know. Yeah. And I blame on that note. I blame social media and misinformation. Well, social there we go. Let's ban it from now on. Now, as soon as we finish this podcast, ban it. Yeah, but we ban it. But if I ban this, because this is supposed to be on YouTube, how are people uh, going to see it? <laughs> I'll leave you to think that out. Look, because you're, you're the brains. You're the, you're the brains. Look, thank you so much. Uh, have a lovely evening. And, I will. Uh, and please, when you get back, let's uh, let's meet for a Zoom coffee or something, or Zoom tea, or Zoom wine. Oh, I'm over the moon with excitement. <laughs> we'll do a wellness wellness session. <laughs> I'll do yo. I'll do yoga. Yeah, yeah, that'll be right. Yeah. Just by the way, um, how can my people find you if they want to follow you or? Uh, uh, well. Or um, I'm terrible at social media. We have, uh, uh, we've got a Facebook page, which is uh, Mama Biashara, M-A-M-A-B-I-A-S-H-A-R-A. Or uh, if people, I, I post my diaries, I do a kind of a blog uh, while I'm there in Kenya, which can get a bit sweary. Um, and it's very kind of full on. It's just honestly what is, happening while I'm out there. And I post that on Facebook, both on my own uh, page and on the Mama Biashara page. So if you want to read the blog, um, uh, that will be there. I am absolutely shit at all other social media. And because we're such a small charity, you know, people say, oh, I'll do your Instagram page. And then they don't. Or So at the moment, uh, Facebook is it. You can message me there if you want to know anything um, and to say the blogs will be there. And I'm going to try and do some little bits of video uh, with the with the ladies and especially like my my best friends and everything while I'm out there. OK. And how long are you going away for? A month. A month. So she's going yeah. away from a month while I am here sitting in this cold. I am. It's, and it, it's going to be hot. You can. This is what we call white privilege. And on those bases. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, my listeners, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Uh, bye. -bye. Uh, bye.